Um, thank you for the uh, very nice introduction. Um, I, what I want to do is to talk about uh, j some very general issues about cancers of the liver and then talk about the surgical uh, approaches which, uh, uh, which I, uh, I do as a surgical oncologist. So the title of this talk is Cancer of the Liver or in the Liver uh, or you know my provider has just told me that I have a spot on my liver, uh, what do I do now? So basically the outline of what I want to discuss is as you see, where is the liver? What does it look like? Some general background information in case you don't know these things, which is important. Uh, background information about liver masses or liver spots or lesions. There are many different terms that uh, uh, medical providers use and, and lay people uh, use. And then more specific issues about liver cancers, the types, the options for surgical treatment, since that's my uh, 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 job today. And, and talking, and, and these treatments are often multidisciplinary. It's not just surgery, it's, it's often uh, surgical, it's radiation, it's uh, medical oncologic with uh, chemotherapy or a variety of modalities that we'll hear more about today. So the liver, as you see, if this, if this is the body here, the liver is the largest internal organ uh, it is actually the, the second largest organ overall behind the skin, but it sits in the right, in the upper abdomen, sort of in the mid-torso. You see the liver here. This is the gallbladder, stomach, pancreas uh, here. From the stomach, this is the duodenum. And this shows another picture of the location of the liver. Um, if you look at liver masses in the general population, the most important thing is that most liver masses or lesions or spots are not cancer. Um, liver masses can be fluid filled or they can be solid and if they're fluid filled they're called cysts or liver cysts or cystic liver masses as I've designated here. Most of them are benign and the, the various causes of these uh, cystic liver lesions include infections, not only bacterial but uh, parasitic uh, infections. Um, uh, some people have congenital cysts, uh, uh, often which are asymptomatic. Uh, you can also develop fluid filled cysts after trauma, and neoplastic uh, cysts also occur as cysts. These are growths in the liver. These are relatively uncommon. Most cysts are benign. Now, of the growths, uh, which are cystic uh, liver masses, uh, as I say, most of them are benign, only rarely are they malignant. Now what about the, the sort of the converse? What about solid liver lesions? Um, there can be benign ones which are not cancerous or there can be cancerous ones or malignant. So the word malignant and cancer or cancerous are the same. And, and to help sort out benign versus malignant, one of the, one of the uh, ways that uh, providers uh, try to sort this out is really through the medical history. Is there a personal uh, history uh, of cancer that this person has? If it's 25 years ago, it's probably not relevant. But if it's in the last year or two or three or five, uh, up to say 10 or so, then that is probably relevant. The other question is, is there a personal history of liver disease? And these are very important. Now, if there's no personal history of cancer or chronic liver disease, then most likely uh, a benign, uh, the, the solid liver mass is benign. And, and the three most common causes of, of, of solid, not cystic, but solid liver lesions are hemangiomas, which are benign conglomerations of blood vessels, or a benign blood vessel growth, uh, liver cell adenoma, which is a benign growth of liver cells, though this one in particular can become malignant. Uh, there are some other problems that can occur, but this by itself is benign. And the other is focal nodular hyperplasia, which really isn't a growth, but it is a benign amalgamation of, of liver cells. And again, that is benign also. Now, if there is a personal history of cancer, and, and, and it's, as I say, in the recent past, and that's sort of uh, variable, what, what means recent, then a cancerous solid liver mass is more likely. And then the question is, what kind of cancer was it? And that's important. Uh, and I list the more common ones, um, uh, colorectum, uh, c cancers of the colon or rectum are, are common, stomach, esophagus, small intestine, less common, but are obviously are, are important. 
uh, pancreas, lung, kidney, breast, uh, melanoma. And I, when I say melanoma is a cancer of the skin, and I don't mean there are several kinds of cancers of the skin, but I mean specifically melanoma, uh, but not basal cell cancer and less commonly squamous cell. But a lot of people get basal cells and those generally don't spread unless they're left alone for years and years. So what does that mean if somebody has a prior history of, of cancer, um, it's a colorectal cancer, um, what does that mean? And, and now there's a, a solid mass in the liver. The, the issue is here is that this probably means that the original cancer, the colon cancer, or the lung cancer, or the kidney cancer, has most likely returned and spread to the liver. And the, the way we describe this is we call it the, whatever the original cancer is, say, or breast cancer, the breast cancer uh, spread to the liver. Or there is liver metastasis, which is one, or liver metastases, which is plural, from breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer to the liver. But it is not called liver cancer. In the medical field, that means that the cancer started in the liver. And we think that the cancer started wherever the, prim wherever the original cancer was and spread to the liver. So why is that important? Because the treatment is based on the type of the original cancer. So the key is that there are often many options available and often multidisciplinary approaches and that these may or may, may, or may not include surgery as, as treatment options. And it depends on the number of tumors that, and where it started. Again, the most important point here that I've underlined is the treatment is based on the type of the original cancer. Now what about the issue about personal history of chronic liver disease? And what I mean by that is hepatitis B or C, but not hepatitis A, which is the old, the old term was infectious hepatitis. B is serum hepatitis, and, and, and hepatitis B and C often lead to a chronic liver uh, condition. Uh, chronic alcohol use, and I don't mean a glass of wine every other day. We're talking a, you know, a pint of uh, rum or a fifth of rum for days and weeks and years. That's, cro that's chronic alcohol use. Or metabolic liver disease, such as hemochromatosis or Wilson's disease. And you might say, I've never heard of that. Well, then you don't have that. Because most of these metabolic liver diseases are inherited. And gee, my father had that same, that, that uh, hemochromatosis, which is an iron storage disease, where you accumulate a lot of iron and can develop um, this last point here, which is cirrhosis, which is a chronically scarring, a chronic scarring of the liver. And in that situation, uh, there, is a, there is an issue about developing liver cancer. So if you're yes to any of these, then a solid liver mass may more likely be cancerous. So cancer of the liver, of the liver in the setting of chronic liver uh, disease is more likely to be primary liver cancer, i.e. when we say liver cancer, it means it started there as I've designated on the next line here. Now usually this type of liver cancer that starts in the liver is a different from breast cancer to the liver or lung cancer to the liver. It is called hepatocellular cancer or, or for short HCC or hepatoma. And as the liver cells themselves become cancerous and it's thought that the chronic liver disease actually causes the primary liver cancer. Now we know that if we eliminate the cancerous mass, this does not treat the underlying uh, disease that caused the liver cancer. And treatment of these primary liver cancers is based on the liver cancer itself. How big is it? How many of them? Which side? Is it throughout the liver or is it just on one side? And what is the underlying liver disease? I, I've said that all these people have underlying liver disease and how bad is it? Uh, do they have jaundice, uh, yellowing of the skin and eyes, and suggesting more, uh, more uh, functional impairment of the liver? So to generalize about treatments now versus in the past, we have better imaging, CAT scans. You've heard of CAT scans, MRI, CT PET scans, nuclear scans. With better imaging, the extent of cancer is more accurately determined before starting treatment. It doesn't make sense to do a localized treatment because we didn't really scan completely and know that the tumor was all over the place. So we really get a better handle on how extensive the tumor is. And because of that, we can better select treatments because now it's, uh, the selection of, uh, of treatments is based on what is most appropriate for the extent of cancer. 
And also, non-cancerous uh, medical problems are better managed, meaning heart disease, uh, lung disease, kidney disease, so that people can better tolerate cancer treatments, no matter what it is, whether it's an operation or chemotherapy or embolization treatment or things of that order. Now, what are the treatment, the surgical approaches uh, to uh, cancers of the liver? Well, one is liver transplantation. That means the removal of the entire liver and replacement from, with liver from a cadaver, um, um, uh, or replacement with a portion of a liver from a re living related person. And this cartoon shows this where the donor has part of his or her liver removed in a, in a major abdominal operation, but let's say is a relative of the person needing a liver transplant. And this portion of the liver is then transferred and implanted into the recipient, the re receiver here, after their diseased liver with tumor is removed. Now this is usually performed in individuals with chronic liver disease and poor liver function and limited primary uh, liver cancer, and usually this hepatocellular cancer, and also acceptable overall medical uh, health, minimal heart lung, uh, lung disease. So if somebody has very bad heart disease and congestive heart failure, they may not be a candidate for transplantation. So what about liver resection, removal of part of the liver? Uh, who is a candidate first? Well, first of all, it doesn't make sense to remove a cancer in the liver if it's spread to the bones or lungs or other places. So it makes sense only if it's a cancer is only in the liver. Uh, cancer location in the liver which is favorable res for resection. Uh, in other words, is there enough liver left to function and support life if we remove that? If we remove 99% of the liver, uh, but there's not enough liver to uh, remain, then it doesn't make sense to do that. Uh, cancer can be removed without cutting through cancer. If the cancer is very large uh, uh, or involving uh, 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 required, uh, let's like say, blood vessels, and we're going to cut through and remove 95% of the cancer, that doesn't really help the person, and that doesn't make sense cutting through cancer. And the key is that the proposed operation has a significant chance to improve survival. Just because you can do an operation doesn't mean you should do it. We do it really because obviously an operation has risks and it's worth taking the risks if we think that the long-term goal is that the, per the person will survive and gain benefit from it. Now, again, liver resection, removal of the liver cancer or cancers with a rim of normal tissue. Uh, because cancers can send out sort of little feelers away from the, what we can see. and We want to make sure that we get widely around those, those sites of cancer. We can remove up to 75% of the liver if the liver is normal to start with, if the fun underlying uh, liver function is normal. Obviously, somebody with hepatitis or jaundice, we can't do that extensive a liver resection because the underlying liver is, is, is ill and won't support life afterwards. And the, another important point is that the liver uh, can regenerate after resection. Now the options are wedge resection. If this is the liver here, we can take a, a if, if it's a very peripheral on the edge of the liver, we can take out a part of the liver like this. There are, even though the liver looks rather homogeneous and all the same, there are different segments to the liver that you see here. Uh, we can do a segmental resection where we remove just one segment of the liver or we can extend, uh, remove, as you see here, a tumor that's uh, this line here, or this line here, separates the right side of the liver from the left side of the liver. Remember, the person is facing us. But in a tumor like this, where there are two tumors, we can do an extended lobectomy here, and this will remain, segments two and three, which, if the underlying liver function is healthy, will support life, and the person will recover um, and the liver will regenerate. Now another surgical approach is ablation. That means killing the cancer without actually removing it. Um, and this can be done with intraoperative placement of a probe into the cancer, uh, which is done under, usually under ultrasound control, so imaging control. And we use either cold, which is called cryoablation, or heat, which is radiofrequency ablation. And these can be used either by themselves or in combination with operations. Say a person has a 
tumor in the left liver, we can remove that, but then there's a small liver in the middle of the right liver. Well, we can't remove the left liver and the right liver, so we remove the left liver and, and ablate the little tumor in the middle of the right liver. So this are cartoons that talk more about radiofrequency ablation, which we tend to use more than cryoablation. Um, you see the liver is here in the operating room. An ultrasound probe is used to guide the needle into the tumor. And we see here the magnification. The needle goes in, and then the inner needles are advanced into the tumor, or tines. And once they are deployed, like uh, as you see on the right panel here, uh, alternating current is passed through these uh, needles. And the, the alternating current, current creates friction, which then creates heat. And so we develop this ball of heat, which reaches 100 degrees centigrade, or, or boiling. And so you get this sphere of, of boiling tissue, which will include the cancer, as well as a rim of normal tissue around it. Now, this I've shown being done uh, operatively. This can also be done uh, non-operatively with CAT scan or ultrasound guidance. Uh, there are certain benefits to doing it open, but some people may not be able to tolerate an operation, and it may be uh, uh, therefore safer to do it uh, under image guidance. So what about outcomes with surgery? And I think that's important. I think that currently there are lower operative mortalities and morbidity associated with surgery now than there was years ago, and there are many reasons. I think surgeons are better trained. Fewer surgeons are doing more of the operations, um, not the converse, not more surgeons doing fewer operations. Another is there are we, it used to be in my teachers when I was in residency uh, uh, a few years ago, um, it was thought that blood loss was not a big deal. You just transfuse blood. We know that giving a lot of blood is probably not beneficial if one can avoid it. And there are methods now intraoperatively to limit blood loss. Um, and that's also good because often with blood, a lot of blood loss, there's low blood pressure and then the, and then there, the body doesn't tolerate low blood pressure and where the liver doesn't function as well afterwards, the kidneys don't function as well so that we can restrict blood loss, the person's blood pressure through their operation does better and they do better. Uh, better anesthesia care, better drugs such as antibiotics. We have better post-operative care, the use of intensive care units and also better methods to deal with post-operative infection. Before CAT scans, which came around in the 1970s, if somebody wasn't doing well and had fevers, they had another operation. So a second operation for infection after the big operation to remove the cancer uh, so that now we can do uh, CAT scans and put uh, tubes into areas of infection to drain that without an operation so that the body does better and recovers uh, uh, better. So what I've tried to do is to summarize just some generalities about the liver, about where it is, about liver masses, or uh, that there are benign lesions, there are cancerous lesions, and the, of the cancerous or malignant lesions, there are those that spread to the liver from elsewhere, and I've given some examples, or there are tumors or cancers that start uh, in the liver, and usually those are in people who have pre-existing underlying uh, chronic liver disease. And we've talked about some of this uh, operative or surgical options um, and the improved morbidity and mortality associated with operation. Thank you.